Okay, welcome everyone to the special database seminar today. It's a pleasure to have with us Professor Jayant Haritsa. He is on the computer science faculty at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore in India since 1993. He is uh, he got his BTEC from IIT Madras and his PhD from the University of Wisconsin Madison. So two degrees we share. Sure, sure. So he's also an academic sibling of mine. Why? Uh, well, actually, no, not really, but an academic cousin ancestor, <laughs> ancestor. 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 A, a cousin of mine from the same database lab at the university of wisconsin madison so the kids, uh, yes he's a fellow of the uh, acm and the ieee and he's currently the president of acm india so he's on a tour of the west coast as part of his duties so it's a pleasure to have you here giant he's going to share with us about some of his work on opaque database queries so looking forward to it thank you giant yeah, take so, it away thanks so much for the kind it's a problem that is in essentially the core relational database area. And I know that this is an increasingly rare topic nowadays, given the data science tsunami that has taken over uh, most of computer science. But I would uh, hope that I could convince you at the, by the end of the talk that there are problems that are both intellectually challenging as well as practically relevant, even in the classical domain. So the specific problem that we are trying to look at here is that how do you extract SQL queries that are embedded or hidden within applications? And we would like to do this by essentially using the database system as a black box and just looking at input output examples. So that explains the second line of the title here is that how do you look into a black box without actually opening it by just figuring out the input and output examples and trying to come up with a function that connects these two. Okay, so uh, the material that I'll be presenting is sourced from the publications that you see uh, listed here. And there is also a project website, which has both uh, short as well as extended uh, videos that cover the underlying uh, concepts behind this problem. And we also have a demo video of a tool called, uh, of a query extraction tool called Anmas that we have developed over the past couple of years. So you can actually look at it working in an industrial strength environment. Okay, so uh, queries that are part of database applications may become invisible or, or uh, uh, opaque. And this could be, for example, because of explicit hiding. And what we mean by this is that it's possible that the application is either encrypted or obfuscated. And this could be because you want to uh, 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 protect the intellectual content that's within the, within the application. Or on the flip side, it could be used for malicious purposes where you want to hide your real intentions. A uh, more benign reason for uh, explicit hiding is that you may have, you have the executable, but you have just lost the source code. And this is a particularly common problem with legacy applications, because over time you may have forgotten where your uh, uh, source code is present and you have just been using the same executable over and over again. And now when you look for it, you don't find it. Alternatively, you may also have the opacity because of implicit hiding. And this is because of uh, 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 many of the tools that we use in the relational world, like uh, often there are object uh, relational uh, mappings where the uh, application developer can think of the underlying database as an object oriented system, but then they get converted to relational equivalents. But what you find is that in these machine generated mappings, the output SQL query is often extremely complex. And I'll show you some examples of that, and it makes it almost impossible to understand. Something else that also happens quite often in practice is that even though the programmers are supposed to be using SQL, often they write imperative code just because they're more familiar with it for programming convenience or because they don't have the necessary SQL expertise. So you also have dense imperative code that is hard to figure out. So let me give you a few examples of this. With regard to the losing of source code, you might recall the two decades back we had this infamous Y2K problem, which occupied center stage in the software industry. And what they found at that time is that in about 40% of the cases, the affected parties had either lost or misplaced the source code. And even harder to believe, when in many of the cases, they had never even had the source code in their position because they had forgotten to take it from the original vendors. You may also have this deliberate opacity for example, you can use a tool called SQL Shield, which is very popular with Microsoft SQL Server. And you can use this to completely encrypt the application. 
And it's not just the application code that's encrypted, it's also all the ancillary meta and metadata structures. Yeah. Like, I, uh, uh, the, meta the ancillary structures, like the stored procedures, the triggers, the functions, and the views. And in addition, it also encrypts the query execution plans as well as the query logs and the audit logs within the database engine. Coming to the implicit opacity, here is an example output from an ORM tool. And what you see in this box is that this is a fairly complex SQL query. You have nested selects here. There's also a case statement, there's an exist operator, and so on. Okay. So on the surface, when you read this, it's very hard to figure out what is happening. But it's actually a very simple and lean mean equivalent is what you can see on the right-hand side here. All that this query is doing is that it's doing a simple join between the orders and line item table. And there are some straightforward filter predicates on the status of the order as well as in the shipping date. So the, this is not just a cosmetic change that we are going to have from uh, saying that here is a complex version and here is the equivalent uh, simple version. What you often find in practice is that when the query optimizer is given this query, ideally you would, you would have wanted it to automatically convert it to this format, but that doesn't happen in practice. And therefore the plan that it produces for this query formulate this way will be very different from the plan that you have for the simpler version. And often this is going to be much slower and inefficient compared to the what you had here. So there is a performance aspect also and not just an aesthetic view of saying that this is an unnecessary complex version of this query. There's also a performance implication because of the limitations of query optimizers to recognize the fact that this is the simpler version of the original query. Okay, so the problem that we have looked at for the past couple of years is that how do you extract these opaque queries that are hidden either under mathematics in the sense of encryption or obfuscation or under the software because of the fact that you have put it under an ORM tool or you have written it in dense imperative code. So the motivation for looking at this problem is that, as I just highlighted, there are several use cases and benefits for this. First is to strengthen the security. For example, injection attacks are very common nowadays and they usually come in an encrypted form. You would like to figure out what is the query that's being done. Is it select star from passwords so that you can figure out whether there's a malicious intent. You may also want to look at it for improving the performance because as we just discussed, you may have more efficient query plans being generated because of the simpler uh, 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 formulation of the original query. It also makes it much more readable for software maintenance because now you can understand what is the logic that's being implemented within the application. And finally, this can also be a cheap way to do code conversion. So as I said, often programmers like to write an imperative code because they're more familiar with it. But if you can have an automated way to generate the equivalent declarative query, then you can still bring in the database query optimizer and all those parts. So you can do imperative query rewriting here. Okay, so now how do you extract this query that is embedded within the application? One approach, which is the classical approach is to apply this heavyweight forensic techniques where you basically take the object to code and then open it up and try to use various kinds of tools to figure out what is the logic that's embedded within that. Now on the positive side, you can actually look at queries with arbitrary complexity and be able to figure them out. But on the flip side, it's largely infeasible in most environments. So for example, if the code has been encrypted, then all the structures are hidden and it's going to be very hard for you to decrypt what is actually present in the application. It's also likely that Many of the database internals that you'd be looking at to figure out what is happening would not be accessible, especially in today's world where most of the deployments are offsite or in the cloud. Plus to apply these forensic techniques, you'll have to come up with customized techniques depending on the specific platform and the application looking at, whether it was Java code, whether it was Python code, whether it was a Windows platform or Linux platform and so on. You'll have to change the techniques to suit the platform and the application. And worst is that this is inherently inapplicable to imperative queries because the logic is very hard to figure out. Okay. So instead, what we have looked at is to say that, can we come up with non-invasive techniques where you essentially infer the query that is sitting inside the application by purely looking at a series of input and output examples. And this is also sometimes termed as active learning in the machine learning community. That is, you learn from the, the function which is within the box by looking at uh, several instances of inputs and outputs here. The advantages are that firstly, it's independent of the platform and the application because you're not looking at the actual code itself. It's also comparatively lightweight compared to the forensic techniques. 
Moreover, it works east equally well with both declarative and imperative code because we don't even know what is the code sitting in there. It could be an actual SQL query or it could, it could be the imperative equivalent. It doesn't matter to us. But of course, there are some limitations as we will see as we go along as to what is the, the nature of the queries and what is the coverage that you have with regard to the complexity of the extraction coverage that you would be able to achieve using these techniques. And just to give you a hint of some of the problems that one might run into is that you can show that fundamentally there are certain impossibilities in the extraction. Okay? And the uh, uh, example for this is that if you are always getting ordered output in the results, you cannot figure out whether this is due to the original query having an order by clause or whether it's an artifact that your plan is using an ordering operator like either sort merge or a metri index and so on. So fundamentally, you could not distinguish between whether the ordering is an outcome of the query or whether it's outcome of the plan. But these are more of a, 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 a kind of a, a simpler issues that don't really affect the semantics of the application. So even if you incorrectly say that there's an order by cause in the original query, that's not really an issue, except that the efficiency may be a little worse than what you might have originally had. Okay. So uh, if you'll permit a small digression, uh, uh, people who are working nowadays in machine learning think that this is the newest kid of the block and everything great in the, in the area has happened in the last uh, five to 10 years. But I just wanted to show you that active learning was actually used as far back as in the Second World War. So this is the famous naval battle of Midway, which occurred in June of 1942. And the situation is that you have the US here. Here is the huge Pacific Ocean and here is Japan. And as you would remember, just six months prior to this, uh, the Japanese had pretty much devastated most of the American Pacific fleet by basically going and bombing uh, Pearl Harbor and, and all the capital ships had been destroyed. So subsequently, the Japanese were gearing up for the final killer blow, saying that whatever's remaining, we'll go and clean it out now, what was left from the earlier attack. And the Americans were also uh, aware of this. Okay? So they were actually worried as to given the fact that they already had a depleted uh, naval uh, battalion now, as to how to handle the Japanese attack. And what is particularly worrisome for them is that they didn't know where this attack would occur. And given that the Pacific Ocean, which you guys know much better here in San Diego, is so huge, where on earth would the attack occur? And if you don't know this, your uh, forces would be spread apart and you would definitely be on the losing side. Okay? And in fact, the uh, San Diego is the perfect venue for this because that's the essentially the home port of the Pacific fleet uh, here. So what they did was that the Americans knew that it's, they were in bad shape. They knew the attack is coming, but they didn't know where. But from their naval intelligence, they had figured out that the Japanese were referring to the location of the attack as a place called AF, but they had no idea where AF was. So then they thought that it could be Midway Island. And in fact, Midway Island is an island which is here, which is exactly midway between the US and Japan and about a few thousand, about thousand miles west of Hawaii. But they weren't, sorry, uh, they weren't sure about it. And if they weren't sure, then they could make a terrible mistake. So what they did is they sent out a fake uncoded radio message. So this is essentially a plain text message, which said that Midway's water purification plant had broken down. So an innocuous message like this. And then they were monitoring the naval intelligence messages from the Japanese fleet. And within 24 hours, they picked up the traffic that AF was short on water. So now they knew that AF was midway. So this is actually, and this actually completely transformed the Second World War because thanks to this prior knowledge, the Americans who even with a depleted force were able to launch a sneak attack on the aircraft carrier fleet to the extent that the entire Japanese aircraft carrier fleet was destroyed in this battle. And this is even now considered the most stunning and decisive blow in the history of naval warfare. Okay? So active learning was there a long time back. But the point that I was trying to make from this is that even though you cannot break the cryptographic code, you can often infer the message. So in the same way, we also don't want to break the application and open it up, but we want to infer what is present within it. Okay, so coming back to hidden query extraction, here's the formal definition of the problem. You are given an opaque application A, which is essentially just the dot of file, and it contains an SQL query Q sub H. So H is for hidden here. And we also expect that the user has given you a sample database instance, DI, on which this application A, when it's run on the sample database, produces a populated result, RI. And now our goal is that we want to unmask the query that is hidden within this application. 
So firstly, this query could either be in native SQL or imperative code. It makes no difference to us because we anyway don't open up the application. Secondly, there is absolutely no restriction on what is DI or RI, except for the fact that it should produce a populated result. That is, we want a result where there's at least one row in it. It doesn't matter whether it has 100 rows or a million rows. We just don't want it to be empty. Now, the reason that we require this from the user is that otherwise, you would have to come up with trial and error database generations in order to come up with at least some output. And in the absence of output, we cannot figure out what is the query that's uh, uh, fundamentally impossible. And if you did this trial and error approach, especially with the very selective predicates being part of the query, then it's an uncertain process with no convergence guarantees. So Jan, do you assume that the schema is known? Yes, so we assume that you have the database with you because you have been running this application on your right. So the schema, is the schema is completely known. Okay. Yes. Right. yes. So you have the, so the think of it that somebody has sent an encrypted uh, injection attack on your system. You don't know whether it has good or bad intentions, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you want to run it on your schema. So that's one model to think of it. So the problem, uh, so here, all that we want is that so typically people who have been running these applications would have databases on which results are being produced. So it doesn't seem a very difficult uh, expectation to have from users that give me at least one database on which I produce some result. As long as it's non empty, we're fine. So, quick, quick question, Jan. Yeah. Another. Yeah. This reminds me of first testing in software yeah. engineering. Right. Is there a constraint on how much extra computation you can do? Uh, no, there is uh, no constraint on that. All we are saying is just extract the result, okay. but I'll show you how we can make this efficient. Got so, it. that will be the second part of what I'll be talking about is that uh, firstly, is it feasible to extract the query? And Sounds then, how great. do you make this in an efficient way? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is the background. And now uh, some of you who have been looking at some of the papers in the query reverse engineering field, which has seen a lot of traction, especially over the last decade, uh, Divesh Srivastava at at and Labs, as well as Chiang Chan at uh, NUS Singapore, they've all been doing work on this. And there are quite a few papers in the leading uh, database uh, conferences and journals on this problem. But I want to show you that what we are doing is a different problem. In query reverse engineering, you are given a database instance D, and there's a result output. And they said that, can you just come up with some candidate SQL query that connects these two? So you want the candidate query to make sure that for on this database, this is the result that's achieved. But in our case, we actually have a ground truth in the application. So we know that there's a precise query. It's not a candidate query. We know there's a precise query which is embedded there, which then means that we want to extract that query such that for any database, it produces the correct result. So this is for all I as compared to here, where it's only for the specific instance. So that's the main uh, conceptual difference. Here. Okay. Now, is this a simple problem? It's actually not because as those of you who have written SQL queries know that there are huge dependencies between the various clauses of the hidden SQL uh, formulations. For example, between filters and loops, there is a tight connection. You may also have renaming of the result columns when using the AS or AS operator. There's also a result consolidation because you're doing aggregate functions like sum, average, and so on. You may also have, especially in the, in the OLAP world and warehousing world, you have several computed column functions like looking at the discounts or looking at profits and so on. So you have scalar UDFs as well. So these are some of the difficulties here. But what I do is to just to jump ahead and show you what is currently is possible, okay, is that this is the hidden query, which comes from query three of the TPCS benchmark. And this is the warehousing benchmark, which uh, has things like customers, orders, and line item, and so on. So this is the, the query that you have here. And as you can see, it features things like an aggregate function. There's also a computed column function here, which connects two attributes. There are multiple joins uh, here. There's both uh, string predicates, as well as numeric predicates here. There's a grouping operator. There's ordering. Uh, there's a limit function, and so on. And let us say you did an encryption using uh, the, the, the encryption uh, uh, procedure here on this entire query and you wanted to extract it. So from our current tool, we are actually able to extract uh, something which is semantically completely identical. So this is the hidden query and we get a query that you see here, which semantically is uh, perfectly matches what you uh, had within the uh, uh, opaque application. The only difference that you would see is that there may be some syntactic changes. So for example, if you look at the group by here, it has order key, order date, and ship priority. In our group by, it's order key, ship priority, and then order date. 
But this change doesn't matter because group by is a set of attributes and not a sequence of attributes. The date yeah. constants are slightly different. Uh, sorry? The date constants. Yes, yeah, yeah. The constants are actually not different. So let me point that out. This is saying less than 15th March 1995. Okay. This is less than or equal to 14th March 1985. So it's a syntactic rewriting of the same things because we present it in a canonical form and there's no way for us to distinguish between these two cases. They're identical. So this is what I meant by there are small syntactic differences in uh, 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 sets or in uh, values, as you mentioned. And, and this is from observing multiple yes. RIs? Yes. So this is from my observing multiple RIs and repeatedly using the original application on different databases. And that comes back to Arun's question is that is this going to be efficient? And I'll actually show you that it can be made very efficient. Okay. But uh, this is what I wanted to uh, kind of highlight to you is the power of extraction that we currently have is that even fairly complex queries, which has all these different constructs, can be extracted uh, using R2. So let me explain the uh, mechanics behind this now. So we have this tool called Unmask, which has this tortured expansion. So it's a unified non-invasive machine for SQL for the extraction. Oh my God. So what we do is that, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so what we do is that we create this uh, uh, template uh, here, where we have the select from where and so on. And for each of these, there are variables like P is the set of projection attributes, A is the set of aggregations, T is the set of tables in the extracted query, join predicates and filter predicates, group by attributes. In order by, it's important that you get the sequence also, right? So that's the reason that it has the vector symbol here. And then there's a limit function. So we create this template query, and then we extract each of these clauses here to fill out the template. So that the, yeah. the search space is restricted to a single select from where block, not yeah. testing. Yeah, so let me explain. Yeah, so exactly the question that you asked is, what kinds of queries can you extract? Okay. So currently, we are looking only at flat single block SPJGAO, GAOL, that's select project join, group by aggregation, order by and limit. And these queries have conjunctive inner equity joins and filter predicates. We are also assuming that the join graph that you have is a subgraph of the schema key graph. That is, all joins are between key attributes, either primary key, foreign key, or foreign key to foreign key. We also assume that it doesn't have self joins. We also assume that the filter predicates are on a disjoint set of attributes, that is, they're on the non-key columns. And all the filter predicates are of this type, column operator value, which in the case for numerical attributes would be the standard equality and range uh, operators. And for textual columns, it's either equality or the like operator in the square. And uh, we also assume that all the keys are positive values. So what I'll be presenting in the rest of the talk assumes this restriction, but we have actually extended this much beyond what is mentioned here. Okay. So the, I'll talk about the scope extensions at the end of the talk. But what I wanted to point out is that even these queries can be fairly complex, even with all these restrictions. And most of the restrictions are actually being followed by the TPC or TPC DS benchmarks. So the joins are typically on the key attributes. The filters are on the non-key columns and so on. So these are not outlandish assumptions but are consonant with most of the queries that you already see in the, uh, uh, these queries. The one major thing that we have still not been able to do, which is the question that you raised, is that can you handle nested queries, for example, which is also part of this benchmark. We are not able, currently able to do that. But we are able to go beyond this to also add things, for example, like disjunctions. We can also do outer joints. We can also do the having clause. Uh, we can also do negation uh, right now this doesn't show negation but if you said name not equal to giant we can uh, handle that so we have been making a progress for the last uh, year or so since this work was done on trying to extend the scope of coverage of the queries and what i wanted to point out is that there are lots of things that we still don't do but what i would like to uh, uh, focus on is that i am actually surprised by how far we have come because when we started this project i thought we will hit a brick wall very soon select star from students and that's it. You cannot do anything more. This is the best that we could reach. And I have been personally surprised that we have been able to take it this far. So more than looking at what has not been done, I'm surprised by how far we've been able to take this approach and efficiently extract queries with fairly complex clauses. There's of course a lot more that remains to be done and some of them may be fundamentally impossible also, but I, I never expected that we could even reach this stage. <laughs>
Okay, so we also assume that you have a private uh, silo copy of the database where you can remove most of the constraints like the key constraints and so on because you want to play around with various things within the database. So in order to create those databases, you don't want the original constraints to be there. Okay, so now let's see as to how this actually all works. This is the internal design of the Unmask tool. So the input is the opaque executable key. So think of this as the encrypted injection attacks on your system. So select star from passwords has been encrypted. This is the executable. And the user is expected to give you a sample database instance on which you know that there's going to be a populated result. Once you start with this, we send it into this pipeline, which has two phases. There's a mutation phase and there's a generation phase. In the mutation phase, we first extract all the tables in the query. So this is the from clause extractor. Subsequently, you extract, extract the join predicates, then the filter predicates, then the projection attributes. This is in the mutation part. So essentially, SPJ comes from taking the original database and mutating it in various ways. And we keep executing the original key here on these databases. The next stage is the database generation part where we create synthetic databases, which are fed to the uh, executable and then look at the output. So here you get the grouping, aggregation, order by limit and so on. And then the last step is that we put all this together in the query assembler. And we also have a checker. I'll explain to you later as to how you can do checking as to whether the extracted query that you had does indeed match the hidden query that was there in the uh, opaque executable. Now, one of the things that you will notice in this process is that sorry, yeah, that, yeah, what is database minimizer again? Yeah, so I've just come to the, the motivate this. Now, in this process, uh, as uh, uh, Alain mentioned earlier, is that we have to run this opaque executable many times, in fact, hundreds of times, which then means that if you run it on the original database given to you by the user, which could be even a petabyte database, this would take infinite time to complete. So, in order to make it efficient, we do a minimization step which takes the original database given by the user and makes it a very small database. So all the subsequent steps of extraction are done on very tiny databases containing just a few rows. And I'll show you, in fact, that most of the cases, it's a single row per table. Similarly, in the database generation, when we create the synthetic databases, we deliberately design them to be very thinly populated. So in fact, in any of the extraction processes, none of the tables will have more than single digit number of rows. So it'd be less than 10 rows all the time. And I'll show you how we can do this. That is why, in spite of the fact that we do this repeated executions, they are done on literally minuscule databases, and therefore the execution is going to be quite fast. And this minimization is key to achieving that uh, minuscule uh, size, because we don't know what is the original database given by the user, which could be arbitrarily large. But once we do the minimization, then it's going to be very fast. Like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the overall problem statement now. You're given the opaque executable E, sample database with a populated result. And here is a, a simple university example. You have tables like student, course, and faculty. And here are the students who are registered or enrolled for certain courses and their performance here. This is the opaque executable E, and this is the output that you're seeing. And you have name and score, which have no connection to the columns that you see here. This is the output that's coming in. You start with this, and your goal now is to say that what is the function that represented in this in SQL uh, world. Okay, so the first thing that we do is that we need to extract the tables that are part of the query because you have a large schema, maybe hundreds of uh, tables, and you want to know which are the ones which are relevant to this particular query. This is fairly trivial to do. All that you need to do is take each of the tables by turn. So you iterate through all the uh, tables in your schema, temporarily rename each table to a something which is not a legal uh, name, which is our outside of the schema. So to some temporary version that's not present in the schema. When you execute the opaque executable on this mutated schema, it's going to throw an error if the table is missing. So if it throws an error, then you know that this table is relevant to the query. If it doesn't throw an error, then you know that it's outside of its irrelevant. So this is a fairly obvious and trivial thing. So the from plus is the easy part. And when you do this for the what I showed you, you may get the, a situation where it says that student enrollment course were part of the uh, executable, but the faculty table is not relevant to this. And I show you uh, here, this is the temporary extracted query, and this is shown with this uh, hat here to, to, to indicate that 
this is the temporary query that we are gradually building up. So we are gradually building up all the components in the query. So this is the starting point. Okay. Now I let's see here why you don't want to tell don't. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, yeah. So this is it causes a lot of confusion otherwise. Exactly. Right. Okay. Yeah. So now let's come to the database minimization. So given the original database instance and this executable producing result, we want to derive a reduced database, which we refer to as D sub min from the original database. And what is the definition of a reduced database? It's that if you remove any row of the tables from those that are appearing in the query, then it leads to an empty result. So every row that you have now in this database is required for producing the non-empty uh, non or a populated result. And the nice lemma that you can show is that for the kinds of queries that we are looking at right now, which is these flat single block SP, J, G, A, OL queries with inner EP joins, there always exists a minimal database where each table in it contains exactly one row. So you can take the petabyte database and make it into single row tables. And how do you achieve this thing? It's a fairly uh, a simple process. You can take each of the tables and do a recursive halving of it. So you break the, let's say the student table into half, run the executable on this half and the rest of the tables. If it produces a result, then you say, okay, this half is good enough for me. If it doesn't produce it, you know that the other half is responsible for producing the, uh, the populated result because we started off with the populated result. So if you do this recursive halving, you can finally get to the stage where every table contains only a single row and we refer to this as D superscript one here. And I'll show this to you with an actual example here. So this is your original set of uh, tables that you had. This was the output. And now I take the biggest table, which is this one and break it into half. So I just arbitrarily remove these three rows here and look at whether if I run the executable on this database, does it still produce an empty or populated result? The important thing to note is we don't look at contents. We're just saying how many rows are there. Just tell me that this is zero or non-zero. Now we find that this is non-zero. So let's keep doing this. Now let's take this table and cut it into half. So now you do this, you'll find that the values change, but the number of rows are still, that it's still a populated result. And if you keep doing this, you finally reach a stage where you get single row tables. Now these rows are not unique. Depending on how you did the halving, it could be different rows. But again, we are not bothered about that. All we want it to, is to be small, and you can bring it down to a single row uh, set of tables, and this is the output that you have. And now notice even the output is a single row. Okay, so now after you do this, the next step is that you want to be able to extract all the join predicates within the step. It's also important to know that the sequence of steps that we have there is very important. You cannot exchange them. So for example, you cannot figure out the filter predicates unless you know what are the tables present in the query and so on. So there is a sequencing that is critical here. So when we do the join extraction, so here is the detail algorithm as given in the paper, but I just quickly go through an example to make it uh, clear. So what we do is we take the original schema graph. So here we assume that we have the database, we know the primary keys, we know the quant keys and so on. That information is there. And we create the structure which essentially tells you the worst case join graph, that these are all the possible joins that could have been present in the query. And what we do is to convert them essentially into cycles, because then you can do easy checking of whether these are present or not within the uh, uh, database query. And subsequently, from these candidate cycles, what we do is we try to cut a, a pair of edges here. Like for example, let's look at the student SID. We want to see whether the student identifier is part of a join predicate or not. That we do by changing the value of the SID in the single row table. So if you go back to the earlier table uh, here, the SID value was 15. So what we do is we negate that value, assuming that negative values are not permissible for student row numbers. So we'll give you minus 15 here. And since it's outside the domain, it's obviously if this was part of the join, you will get an empty result. And in fact, that is what will happen here. When you run the executable on this mutated database where the value 15 was replaced by minus 15, which is outside of the acceptable domain, you get an empty result, which tells you that this is a, a attribute that is participating in the join. So if you do this, for example, with the, uh, the teaching assistant ID, you can take 25 and make it minus 25. But because teaching assistant is not part of the join predicate here, you will get a non-zero result because it's not filtering out anything. So if you continue this process, you will get new candidate cycles as you go along. And to cut to the chase, 
eventually what you will get is that when you look at the course id again here we'll change the course id from being 10 to minus 10 and we find that you get an empty result which then means that this join edge is actually present in the user query so once you do all of this you'll find that these are the two join predicates that are present in your uh, query you had the worst case graph and then you're picking up the edges which are relevant to this particular query by using this uh, uh, approach of negating values so that if you get an empty result, it means that it's participating in the query. Yeah, yeah. we are assuming here that we're only talking about empty joints. We are uh, uh, for, now. for now. I'll come in the end. To, we have also extended it to outer joints, but that requires quite some more work. With the simple pipeline that I showed you here, you can handle only uh, uh, equi joints, and also the all the predicates are conjunctive predicates with the filters and so on. So that is the assumption. Yes. So you you also extend it to theta joint, right? Less than theta. So uh, yeah. Right. So I'll I'll come to, I'll, sh I'll show that to you in the in the, in the last slide. Yes, but we have been actually able to also do uh, non equi joints as well now. It's not in the original papers, but this is something over the last six months that we have been able to actually achieve. Yeah, so I'll come back to that. Uh, now, what about the filter predicates? You know the joints, but you don't know what are the kinds of selection predicates that are here. So what we do is we take the original, uh, so you want to check, uh, the, uh, for example, whether a table T, which has an attribute A, is it participating in some selection predicate on the underlying uh, table? So let us say it has a value K in the single row database that you have. We also know the domains of each of the columns. So this is again an assumption in the schema that you know the domains. Mm -hmm. So let's say the range is I minimum to I maximum. So what we will do is we'll take this value K, which was appearing in the single row database and replace it with the lowest value in the domain, which is I min, and then execute this opaque uh, 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 application to get result R1. Similarly, you do this k with i max and again execute it to get R2. Now, based on the sizes of R1 and R2, you will have these four possible cases that show up here. That is, either R1 is empty or not. Similarly, whether R2 is empty or not. We are again not looking at contents, we're just saying cardinality. Is it zero or non zero? If both of them are no, that is, you got non empty results for both R1 and R2, then we can show that there is no predicate here. Nothing has been achieved because you are looking at the edges of the domain and nothing got fit there. But if you found that R1 was empty, but R2 was not, then you have a left sided predicate. Similarly, on the flip side, you will have if R2 is empty and R1 is not, you have a right sided predicate. And if both of them are empty, then you know that this is a double sided range predicate. So to show an example here, for example, earlier the credits were four in the single row database. Let us assume that the number of credits, the legal range is from zero to 20. So I will replace the credits here with zero and run the query and run the executable again. And in this case, I get an empty result. Then I change the credits to be the maximum value, which I'm just assuming uh, to be 20 here. So I put 20 here. When I run the executable again, I get a, a populated result. So this tells me now that we are in case two, where there's a left-sided predicate. And what we mean by that is that you are having a constant uh, uh, here, L, which you need to figure out. This is the attribute A, which is coming from here. And then, of course, it's less than the maximum value in the domain. Now, how do you figure out this value here? Because it's somewhere between 0 and 20. You can do a binary search between this value and the value K. Okay. If you do the binary search between 1 and 4, you'll get L equal to two in this case, which means that the credits should be greater than or equal to two. That's the predicate that you have. And that's why four was working. When you had A equal to four, it worked. But when you had A equal to 20, it worked. But when you have A equal to zero, that's not greater than two, and therefore you got an empty result. So that's the way you can figure this out. Now for floating point values, this is not so simple to do the binary search, but if you have finite precision in the floating point, then you can do the same trick as well. Okay. So now let's look at projections. This is a much harder problem because the projection animal comes through in many different avatars. Okay. So firstly, you may have the projected column as coming as just being an input database column with the same name, or the columns may be renamed because of the AS operator. You may also have them being aggregated, or they may also be computed columns. Okay. 
So now one of the interesting things that happens is because we have a single row database, any aggregations are going to be identical because if you have only a single row, then all the aggregations will give you the same value, whether it's sum, min, max, whatever, it makes no difference because it's a single row database. So temporarily, we can keep the aggregations aside and saying, let's just figure out the projections and subsequently figure out the aggregations. And so it allows you to do this in a staged manner. Okay, now how do you figure out, given this input database and the output columns as to what are the dependencies? So we treat each of the result columns as an unknown constrained linear functions of one or more input database columns. So uh, here is an example where you have an output column O, which is dependent on two input database columns A and B, which are unknown. And then we assume that you have an equation like this, which is a linear equation with coefficients small a, b, c, and d. Now you might say, okay, it could have been a more complex function. It could have been quadratic and so on. We are currently not handling that because most of the cases that we have seen are essentially linear functions. Okay? 0 0.01 into discount plus profit into something else and so on. So this is the assumption we have. So the, in order to produce this equation, you have two steps. First of all, you need to know what are the identities of the database columns. And the second is you need to compute this function one steps to complete the function. So what we do is to do an iterative column exploration. That is, we take each of the columns here. Uh, sorry, uh, what we do is that we take, for example, each output column here and see which are the columns here that affect the value here. Okay. So for example, let's look at the value score, uh, this column called score, and then we will check each of the attributes which are present in the input database columns and seeing that whether by changing this value, does it have an impact on the output of that. So for example, here, I will change the marks from being 50 to one. And you see that the value here has also changed. We don't care what is the change, we just know that it has changed, which then tells you that the score value here is dependent on the marks column. Whereas had you changed the number of credits, for example, it's possible that it didn't change. Or if you change the age of the student, the score may not change. So we look at the impact on the output of any change in inputs. And if there's an impact, then we know there's a dependency. So if you continue this process, now we right now know that score depends on marks. And once you do this over all the input columns here, we find that score depends on marks and credits, but doesn't depend on, for example, age. Okay, this is it. So now you are able to figure out the input columns. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just think this is a bit more refined uh, than what we're trying on the slide mm -hmm. because if I end up changing the joint attributes, uh, we'll probably take into account the joint that covered and changed. Yes, and yes. Work. Okay. So that is exactly the second line here, which I lost over as you said. In doing this process, you have to ensure that the joint predicates and the filter predicates are still being retained because otherwise the wrong reason could be ascribed for getting an empty result. Yeah. So that is what we call as S values here. S means that it's a satisfying value. In the previous two steps, we have identified the joint predicates, we have identified the filter predicates. We need to make sure that those predicates are still being retained and, they, and that it's not that they are the cause for some of these empty results. So we do do that, okay? So that's the underlying thing which I kind of lost over here. You have to make sure that any of these mutations that you're doing, they should satisfy the previously determined filter and joint predicates. And this can be done. So one yeah. more question. Yeah. Uh, is there, after doing those checks with the predicates, is there still a possibility of a false negative here? Uh, you make a mutation, but it doesn't right. affect the output, but no. in the actual query, it is still part of the uh, at least we have been able to show proof that there should be a change in output whenever you make a change here, unless there is a conflicting. So that is the reason that you need these S values to make sure that all the previous values are still being retained. Okay. And if you make a change, this will have an impact on this. Like if in the aggregation expression, if you have a lower right. bounding right or now upper we don't bounding. Have an aggregation because of the single row database. Okay. So that is the advantage that you have. You okay. have so you'll come back to yes, that. Yes, we'll come back to okay. that. Okay. So, uh, huh. Uh, assuming all of the constraints are met, and assume yeah. you have only filter drawing and projection, yeah. does this pack time give you the unique query of the original one? Is there a possibility? Yeah, the pipeline does give you a unique query. Now, whether it's correct or not is something that we have a specific checking module, which I'll come to. Uh -huh. But the question that he was raising is that it's possible that you may have changes here, which do not get reflected and change the output. And we actually, there are certain cases where it does happen and we, I can show you later in the paper where we, we know how to handle that by doing certain multiple changes at the same time, such that you can the, the definitely know whether an output column 
which are the specific columns on which it depends. So we won't have the false negative situation. Okay. Follow up on my follow question here. Not really query because the query that you get here is based on one of your D2 perspective one, but there are many of them. So I'm curious how you then put them together. Yeah, together. well, okay. So let me just show this to you. So right now we know that score depends on these two columns. Okay. So then in the next uh, uh, phase, what we do is we, we know that we have four coefficients now because there are two columns on which the dependency is there. So we create a system of linearly independent equations where we mutate the single row database by putting different values for A and B, where A and B are the marks and credits for us. So here there are four such values that we give and we get four independent equations here. Now you can look at the results, it will be 1.02 in one case, 2.1 and so on. And you can easily solve this set here. And once you do this, you will get the coefficient values as 10.010. So now you get a score to a function which says it's marks plus marks into credits into 0 0.01. This is what you know about. This is still not correct because there's actually an aggregation function behind this, but the aggregation function we're going to discover later, not right now. So it is not complete, but it is unique in that sense that this function is the correct one. So is this what you were asking about? This is going to be a unique query that we finally produce because there is a unique query in the original uh, uh, application. We will get a semantically equivalent query in the sense that it may not be identical word to word, but it will be exactly the same query. So if the original query is a, a, a specific SQL query, we will get the semantically equivalent version of it. Yeah, yeah, that was exactly my yes. question. Yeah. I was wondering, does this, I, yeah. it, it seems to me that this would always give you the, the semantically correct query. Is yes, it, as long as the query is within the scope of things, like yeah. for example, we, we cannot handle the self join as was mentioned. So as long as it's within the scope that we have, restricted it to, you can actually show formal proofs that it will give you the correct query. And I'll come back to this in the end uh, as to what is the scope that you can extend it to. Okay, so, so sorry, right one, the, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, sorry. I'm confused, why, why is it linear? Uh, okay, that's, that's just an assumption. That is just an assumption is that that's typically that uh, uh, restriction of the size. Yeah. Oh, I because see. To, to restrict what are the coefficients you want, but it Got would it. have been AB squared and so on. Okay. We so assume you, that okay. you're so handling the class of linear yeah, functions. Linear functions. functions. Okay. So actually what happens if it's not, then you will not be able to solve that system. Yes. yes. And that's when you know, actually what do you do? Do you just yeah. throw in the towel or is there a way to? Uh, okay, right now we're assuming that these are well-behaved systems which obey the requirements that we have. Right. What happens in other cases that you may get a query which is not identical to the original query, but is some relationship to it. So you may get something which gives you, let's say, a superset of the results, for example. So that is a problem that is certainly there, but this is just the starting point. So you're absolutely right is that you could have alternate function polynomials here, and then we would not be able to do this in general. But uh, one other approach is to do enough number of equations such that you can get all possible cases. So if you have a maximum degree in the polynomial, then you could probably uh, create enough number of uh, examples which are linearly, which are independent of each other, such that you can get the coefficients. So this is essentially a polynomial fitting function. Yeah. And you can do a, a, a see the, the one of the difficulties here is that to get each of these equations, you have to run the executable. But since it's single row, that's okay. So even if you said create 200 examples and do it, that's not going to be expensive because all of them are running on single row databases. So we could do that as well. So as long as you have some limit on the complexity of the polynomial, we could do this. But right now we just look in the linear case. Yeah. Okay, so you solve this. So right now at the end of the mutation pipeline, you have the SPJ core of the query. So we have the two joint predicates. Uh, sorry, we have the three tables, student enroll course, the two joint predicates, which we discovered uh, there by using the negation. We realized through the numeric filter predicates that greater is greater than equal to two. I didn't talk about the, 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 the like operator because that's a much harder problem than numeric predicates, but it's there in the paper. So there is a department ID like CS percentage. And we also have the projection attributes, but they're not complete because there's actually a sum function which is here, which is missing right now. Okay. So this is the SPJ core of it. Now, the next step is the generation pipeline where we carefully feed in synthetic databases to elicit, elicit as to what is the group by aggregations and so on. So let me just show this to you for the group by case. You want to check that given table T, which is part of the query, does its attribute A exist in the group by set of columns or not? So what we do is to create a database called D subgen, 
such that the intermediate SPJ code will contain three rows satisfying this condition that T dot A has a common value in exactly two rows, while all the other columns will have the same value in all three rows. Okay. Now notice that the intermediate things is not visible to us because it's all hidden within the application. But if you give a carefully calibrated input, and I'll show you this to you in the next slide, you can know what is going to be happening inside the system, although it's not visible. So if you do this, you can show that the final result of this query can have exactly one, two, or three rows. The one row corresponds to the case where you have an aggregation, but there's no grouping. The three corresponds to the case where there's neither grouping nor aggregation. And the two corresponds to the case where there's a group one. So if you have, again, we're looking at cardinalities and not contents. If there are only two rows in the output, then you know that there's a grouping on T dot A. So let me show that to you here. Uh, here is the algorithm, but let me just show you the example case here. What we do is we take the student table and let us say we want to check whether student or SID is it part of the group by output. So what we'll go and do is to put make three rows here. Two of the rows will have the same value for SID and the third row will have a different value. And all the other columns here will have the same value across all the rows. Now here is the reason that you need to make the private silo of the database because you're violating the fact that SID is a primary key. But we need to be able to do that to bring out this information. Now the enrolled table is has a join connection to the student table. So you need to make sure that the join is still operational. So we put a one and a two here, but the rest of the values are all identical. And then there's the post table. So what we know is that if you do this join here, the SPJ part will produce this intermediate result. It's not visible to us, and that's why I've shown this in a dotted line, but we know that this is what is going to happen because we know the join predicates, we know the filter predicates, we know that this is what is going to be produced. Now, when we look at the final output, if this has two rows, then it means that there was a grouping because there's a grouping on one and a grouping on two, which produced the answer. And therefore, you know that this uh, attribute, SID of student, student ID five, is actually part of this group. So just by looking at cardinalities, you can figure out a lot of things. Now, when you come to uh, aggregation, uh, I don't know how much time we have. Uh, oh, uh, this, this is, how much uh, more do you have? Uh, we okay. have another half an hour, but. Oh, we have, okay, yeah. then, then it's, yeah. You have so, your meeting after that. Right, right, so yeah. So if you look at aggregations, so what we assume is that this output column O is an aggregate function of something which is within this brackets here. And when, how do you know this F sub O? This is the function that we previously identified in the projections part. And what we will do is that, so the basic idea here is to say that, I'll again carefully give you a design database such that each different aggregation will produce a unique value in the output. Okay. So let me just uh, show that to you here. You create a set of uh, input arguments. Okay, so maybe I'll just skip this uh, detail here. I'll just show you what we are trying to do here. So what you do is you create this database like the one that is shown here. So you in student, you have a single row. In n row, you have two rows here. And in the course, you have this information. Now, the way that we have created this is such that if there was a minimum function, the value that you get in the output would have been 1.04. If it was a max function, it would have been 2.08. If it was a count, it would have been 2. If it was a sum, it's 3.12 and it's average 1.56. It means that each of the values is different, which then in the output, depending on which value you get here, you know the aggregation function. So how do you know how many rows to create here? Then you're supposed to generate k plus one rows. How do you figure out the value of k? That's actually a, a, a kind of an interesting uh, a set of uh, um, uh, uh, constraints where you try to insist that all the values coming from the different aggregations will be different. You can actually show that this is the formula that you need to ensure that k is not any of these. Okay? So you can see the details in the paper, but you need to ensure that k is not any of these values. And the maximum value that you can get here is six, which means that the upper bound on k is six, which is again a small set. Okay? So I can go over the details with you later, well, but basically the point is that we are ensuring that we given these six rows, any aggregation function that you produce will have a different unique value. And therefore, by looking at that value, you can identify which one is present right now. So this forbids the k values resulting in equality by putting these constraints here. Okay. So in this particular case, for example, when you run the executable, 
This is the invisible intermediate result you get. And you look at the output, you will get the score to be 3.12. And 3.12 tells you that this is a sum function. And that is how you can get the. Okay, so let me come to the part which is uh, also critical now is that, okay, we can, we have produced some predicates. You can fill in the query template with the extracted elements, and then you can do some kind of canonization of the original query so that you remove any of the redundant predicates and columns. But now it comes back to the question that he also asked is that how do you know this is correct? Okay, you just produced some SQL query, how does it match with the original database, uh, with the original application? So the first thing at least that we need to definitely do as a sanity check is to run this extracted query and the uh, uh, opaque application on the same original database and check whether the results are the same or not. If that's not the same, then clearly we are messed up. But even if they're the same, it doesn't mean it's correct. Second thing we can do is that we can do a statistical testing where you synthetically generate large randomized databases and feed them to both these application as well as the hidden query and see whether the outputs are the same or not. And in case they're different, then you know, you know there's a mistake. But even there, there's a possibility that coincidentally that the results are the same and there's actually a mistake. So for example, the original query had a left outer join, but I have represented it as an equi join. I will not be able to figure this out in general with randomized databases because they might be having matching triples always, and there may not be a case where you have something in the left table which is not present in the right table. So for that, we have actually used to get a more focused checking of the correctness, we use this uh, tool, which was developed at IIT Bombay by Professor Sudarshan and his team, which is called the XData tool. And this was meant for a completely different purpose. The goal they had was to say that, look, I'm teaching these large undergraduate classes. I'm asking them to write SQL queries, but how, uh, how am I going to go and look through each of these queries? Because in SQL, you can write the same query in many different ways. How do I know whether the query written by the student is correct or not? And often the students were getting upset with the TA saying that you didn't figure out that actually the query error was right. So there is an instructor query, which is the model answer. There are many different student queries, some of which are correct, but written differently and others which are wrong. And how do you know this? So they created this, this tool called XData, which generates databases that are specifically designed to discover subtle semantic differences between the model instructor query and the various student queries. So for example, if the student has replaced the left of the join with equi join, they will generate a database such that the difference gets shown up and this result is, is not compatible with each other. So if you use this tool, then you can do it in a focus panel because you're looking at the predicates and saying, I want to check whether this predicate is being done incorrectly in the student query or not. For example, it could also be that you have the query was age greater than or equal to 120, but the student has written it as age greater than 20, which is a different query. Now, in our case, the interesting part is that, uh, yeah, I'll just finish this and come back. So the interesting part is that we don't have the model query. The model query is in some senses in the application, but that's hidden. So what we do is we take the student, the extracted query and call it the instructor query, because we are not looking at instructor versus student. We're just saying, is there a difference between the two? And if there's a difference, we have screwed up. That's what we do. So we take the extracted query and make it instructor and make the application query to be the student query. So you essentially flipped it, but because there's a symmetric difference between the two, if there's a difference, we are wrong. If there, there's no difference, hopefully we are right. Yeah, so, so I'll, yeah. Question one, it seems to me from how you describe this process that the databases are generated, yeah. taking as input both the instructor query and the student query. No, it's only the instructor query, it uh -huh. looks at all, it's only the instructor okay. query. Yes, so it looks at all the clauses in the instructor query and says, okay. how could the student have messed up on it? Okay. So okay. essentially they do that, yeah. It would have not scaled if it had the generation. Yes, 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 it would definitely not have scaled. And then so, the second one is more speculative. Okay, and if the symmetric difference is not empty, and we know we screwed up, is there anything we can learn from this? Or do we have to start from scratch? Yeah, right now we have not uh, uh, kind of considered the case where you have failed. We have just said that this is what we have done, but potentially you could use this query as the seed to come up with the, the proper query. But uh, because some of the predicates should be right and some would be wrong, certainly, which is the case. And uh, uh, so far for the uh, set of uh, uh, restricted uh, query coverage that I described earlier, we can show formal proofs that you would get the exact query, which is there in, in, within the uh, uh, application. 
But for uh, example, like uh, right now, we're not handling outer joins in this, uh, what I described so far. And if the application had outer join and we produced a liquid join, we would be making a mistake. But it's not that we are making a complete mistake of all the predicates. Some of them would be wrong, some would be right. And we could get errors like this, uh, certainly. So the scope of the coverage is very important that it's within this restrictive set of clauses that we can handle it. So, so that doesn't mean that within this restricted class, there are actually a sum that is complete. Yes, yes, case. yes. You can actually show the proof that this is sum complete, right? All right. Yeah. So he, here is the final output of the extraction of this after doing all these tests. This is what we claim is present in the opaque executable, and you can see that all the things we discussed so far. This was the SPJ part that we did earlier. Now we said there was a group by student or SID, which we showed through the Two row output. It's also grouped by S name. There's an I didn't talk about the order by because it's fairly complicated, but you can do the order by as well. Then you can also put in the limit function, which is uh, the 10 that you see here. And now you can also see that the aggregation, which was initially missing in the projection, has now been brought in because the sum was 3.12 and then that's the unique value which matches with this. If you look at the original query, this is what was uh, present in the hidden application. And you can see again that the semantic semantically is identical. Some of the values would have changed, like again here, this is greater, greater than one, but we would have rewritten it in the format of greater than or equal to two and so on. And again, you'll see that in the group by, we have flipped the ordering of the attributes, but that doesn't matter because group by is a set based attribute. So, so and uh, uh, coming back to Alan to your question, you can show the proof of correctness that within this restricted class that we are focusing on, uh, then you can show that uh, you would definitely get the correct query being output, which would be the unique query that's present in the application. Yeah. Okay, so now is this efficient or not? Okay. Which is uh, because on the surface it looks like you're running the executable hundreds of times. Obviously, it's going to be slow. So, we have done experiments with both the applications which have coming from the standard uh, database benchmarks as well as imperative code within these blogging applications. So here is an example uh, output here. So this is from the TPCS benchmark at the 100 GB scale. What you see on the x-axis are different queries from the 22 queries of the uh, uh, TPCS benchmark, but they have been modified to suit our requirements of being restricted to only, for example, the nested queries are not here. So we have taken the core of the query, but not some of the additional stuff that's present there. So these are the modified versions, but still even the modified versions have fairly complex uh, behaviors. And on the y-axis, you have the time for extraction. And what you'll see here is that the extraction time is in the order of a, uh, 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 like less than 10 minutes, even on a 100 GB database. And most of the extraction time is taken up by the minimization process, because the original database has to be reduced by recursive halving, and that is where the primary time is spent. The actual extraction post-minimization is the green line. The green lines that you see here are very minuscule, so it just takes a few seconds. So you might also look at the situation where the user himself or herself gave you the minimized database as a start, because that is also a candidate database. Then it would have been only a few seconds for all of this. Here we're assuming that the user gave the entire TPCS database to you and said, go and do something with it. In that case, it's of the order of a few minutes. If you look at TPC DS also, which is the more recent avatar of TPCH, again at 100 GB scale, these are different queries from the 99 queries that are present in the benchmark you see that they complete in a few minutes here. So all the extractions are completed in a few minutes. And we also expect that you will not be using this in a online fashion. You'll be doing this because you have an application and you have lost something there or you can't figure it out. So you would want to go back, do it in an offline way. So even if it took a few minutes or an hour, it doesn't matter because you're going to do this once. Yeah, I don't remember. Where does sample come in? Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. I'll, I'll skip over that. I'll, I'll come to this in the next step. So here the extraction time is uh, also you can see is comparable to the execution time on the original database. So for example, for verify here, if you took the original application and did it on the TPC database, that itself takes seven minutes. So in that sense, our extraction in 10 minutes is not hugely different from a single execution. And most of the time is spent in this reduction. And we do have hundreds of invocations, 300, 400 times we have to do this, but it's on minuscule databases, so it's very fast. So now let me come to the question that is very relevant, which Alan was asking is that right now, since most of the time is being taken on doing the recursive halving of the original petabyte database into the single row, 
could you instead do it bottom up where you do it as a single row, uh, where you essentially create samples and see whether the samples themselves produce a populated result, which case would be ideal. So suppose I took 100 samples from each of the tables, I ran the executable and it gave me a populated result. I'm going to be thrilled with it because I don't have to reduce this. Uh, so maybe I'll jump ahead to, uh, to that part, which is there. This is what we call as productive sampling. That is, instead of doing reduction of the tables, you could instead try sampling on the original tables to cheaply produce a populated result. Even if it's one row, it's fine. We are done with it. But here the difficulty comes in, which is uh, which you would also know very well about, is that the sampling does not compute to the joint, uh, does not compute to the joint. And, we, and what we have found over the last few decades, which is a classical problem, is that the join of the samples does not distributionally match the samples of the joint. And this has been a historic problem for doing approximate query processing on samples. But the interesting thing is that we don't care. We are not interested in being matching the approximation output. We just want one row in the output. So instead, we don't want uh, distributional matching. We instead, we want diversity in the intermediate join outputs. Because if there's diversity, we are hopeful that at least one row will eventually succeed and come out as the output. So that at least some of these tuples make it through to the end. So rather than wanting distributional semantics, we want diversity semantics to ensure that the sampling produces at least one output. So this is what we call as productive sampling. It's not doing approximate query processing, but it's ensuring that there is an output given the samples. So you need to really design new sampling techniques that maximize diversity and not distributional matching. So we actually have some techniques for this. Initially, we did a crude thing where you just did independent samples and said, let me cross my fingers and pray hard and then let it come out. So that's the sampling that's being shown here. Uh, which is the sampling time, which is here. But in some cases, if the original predicate is very selective, so if you say age less than two, for example, in uh, UCSD, there's going to be very few such tuples matching, sampling will not work. So at some stage, you would give up and go back to the halving process, which is a deterministic algorithm. Yes. But right now, we have uh, changed the, the, we have started using the most sophisticated sampling algorithms that have been developed for the last decade, like the, the CS2 algorithm, which looks at correlated samples and so on. We need correlated samples to get the joints to be productive. So we have a new sampling algorithms now, which actually most often succeed, unless the predicate is very, very fine grained. We can do this. And in the worst case, if it doesn't work out after a few sampling iterations, then you can always go back to the recursive halving process, because that is guaranteed to terminate. It's guaranteed to give you the answer. It's a deterministic process. But sampling would be a cheap way to try it out first. Yeah. So that's what I was going to ask, why do they coexist? Yeah. So here you tried sampling, yes. that's the dark red. Yes, that's the dark red. And then you have to revert to, to, to this. Right. Yes, right. What or is it? Yeah. Or, in all cases, you have to revert to No, you're not revert to this. So you have produced enough number of samples, and then if you've got an output, you then you do minimization on the samples. Ah. Because you produced, let's say you took 10,000 samples from each of them, and you did get a populated result, you still want to bring it down back to D1, which is yes. a single row database. Okay. But you're doing it on the small sample databases are brought down to D1, rather than the petabyte database being brought down. So that's what we see. Sampling was done and followed by a minimization of the sample database. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So... We have also done this on this real world job benchmark. And uh, if you have seen this benchmark, you'll know that it has very complex joint graphs going from seven to 12 uh, different joints uh, in the various queries that are present here. And again, the interesting thing is that you can do this in a few minutes because the extraction takes almost no time, which is the green bars that you see here, takes very little time. It's primarily the reduction of this database size that takes most of the extraction time. And you can also make even the recursive halving that I mentioned, right? Initially, when we have done this experiments, we were actually making copies of the database. So you took the original line item tables, broke it into half and made two copies. You don't need to do that. You can use views instead. Once you use views, there's no copy and it's actually much faster. So recently we have actually implemented that also in system. So even these claims of that recursive halving takes time is not really correct because if you do it with views, it's very quick. You can do it much faster. And so here is an example of an imperative code, which is from a blogging application called Enki. And this is what was written by the original programmer. And this is written, uh, uh, as you can see, that there are a specific uh, imperative uh, procedural code that he has written. 
Now, this is the equivalent SQL that's produced from, from, uh, from this original application. This is the equivalent SQL that we, we come up with. And if you look at this extracted SQL query, what we can do is that we can now run the database query optimizer on this, whereas the uh, processing logic is hard coded here. And we, after the extraction, it just took a few seconds. We found that there's huge execution speedups. This ran an order of magnitude faster than the code that was here because the programmer here did not understand database optimization. So it was written in an inefficient way. Given that we have been able to do the translation, now the database optimizer can come into the act and, and improve this. Okay, now let me come back to some of the extensions that we have been able to do subsequently. We are able to handle the a Boolean and date, date types as you already saw. We can also handle floats with a fixed precision or some limited precision. Some of these other specialized functions can also be done. Currently, we have been working on disjunctions as well as outer joins and negations. So for example, name not equal to giant and so on. But then the structure has to be different a little bit in the sense that you cannot do one iteration through the pipeline. You may have to go back into the pipeline a couple of times, keep periodically refining whatever you get. So this will require multiple iterations in the pipeline. And then the having clause is the hardest problem because now you cannot do D1 here. Because with the having clause, you may say that the total mark should be greater than 300, then you require at least three courses and so on. So this goes out of the window at this time. But, and in fact, if you want to uh, extract this, it actually requires a significant surgery of the entire pipeline sequence. But we are actually able to handle it. But it's not that the original pipeline would work. We have to move some of the things around and do this differently. And what we try to do here is instead of having D1, we try to get R1 instead, saying what is the minimal database that will produce a single draw output. And now you can actually extract the having clause as well. But this requires a significant change in the infrastructure. Yeah, but the way yeah. so you always force a single row output? Yes, you can force it because there will be some. Uh, 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 say, except in the case of self joints where you could have multiple rows by definition coming out, in all other cases, you can show that there will be a single row output with the minimal input for the having clause. That, that there will be done. Yeah. Okay. So here are some of the other uh, open problems. Well, what if you have multiple instances of the same table in the front row? This is hard. We have not yet completed the work on the set operators like the unions, intersection, minus. In particular, see, even if, for example, if you have a union where there's query one, union query two, we may be able to get all the tables that are present in your know, query one and query two using the from clause extractor. But you don't know which tables are part of which subquery here. And that is a hard problem. We have been able to solve it in some restricted cases where the set of tables in one subquery is not a subset of the queries in the other subquery. So under certain specialized cases, we can do it, but still we don't have a complete solution here because there's an easy scope for confusion as to where the tables are present. But we are currently working on this. Then this comes back to the question that you asked previously that can you handle greater than or less than and so on. So when we started working on nested queries, which is was my ultimate goal, I realized that the student came and told me this is too tough. Can you give me something simpler? And then I realized that in order to be able to do nested queries, a necessary but not sufficient condition is to be able to handle algebraic predicates. That is where you have attributes on both sides of the equation. So it's not column operator value, but column operator column, like uh, student dot uh, age greater than advisor dot salary. If you have those, that is a requirement to be able to do nested queries. So once you have algebraic filter predicates, then this is like a join where this is the joins can also be fitted into this model and the operator could be greater than or less than it. So, so this we have done over the last few months, we have actually been able to do again under with certain mild assumptions and restrictions that we can handle not just arithmetic uh, filter predicates, but also algebraic predicates. And once you can do algebraic predicates, all the joins and all the filters, all of them automatically fall into the same class. There are specialized versions of this. So that's what is currently going on. This is of course something that we are, uh, is probably still a, quite a ways away to handle correlated nested queries. If they're uncorrelated, there's no problem because we will produce the decorrelated version automatically in what we're doing. But if they're correlated, this is a hard problem. And as I talked to you already, there's an interesting sampling problem here. With this, the goal of sampling is to produce diversity and not to produce uh, 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 matching semantics. And something that you might probably like very much here is that is there a limit of the extraction that you, uh, that you can achieve saying that at most you can do second order logic. 
but beyond second order logic cannot be handled by active learning. Is there such a theorem? Okay. Because we have kept trying to add more clauses, but it's possible that some clauses can never be done and we'll be just banging our head against a brick wall here. So is it possible to give a limit saying that this is the maximum logical power that can be extracted using purely input output examples and without opening the rocks. So if you can produce a limit, then we know when to stop or we at least know how far we have to progress before we hit the uh, uh, ultimate barriers. And uh, something else that seems also very far off on the horizon is that if you have multiple queries with an application where one SQL query results with something else, then that is almost impossible for us to do unless you assume that there are JDBC calls which give you the results of each intermediate computation. So this is, uh, I think, a way in the future, but there are many applications which have a single query, so those we can extract. Uh, or yeah. like Ruby and Rails, which you mentioned, yeah. which have a log, and you say we can go query that was sent to the server, then yes. it's log. Yes, if that's a log, then we can do that as right. an, on a piece by piece right. basis, you can certainly do that. But if they're directly feeding from one query to the next, and there's some intermediate logic, then that's much harder to do. So in fact, I was keen to get your thoughts on whether you feel that something like this can be done, where you can actually uh, identify the expressive power of active learning extraction and say that this is the limit that you can do. Uh, and certain other kinds of properties cannot be by definition even uh, amenable to active learning extraction. Yeah. So these are some of the problems we already talked about sampling. So the overall uh, takeaway is that there is a new hidden query extraction problem, which is completely different from query, query reverse engineering, although it falls into the same class of, uh, 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 of concepts. There are lots of use cases ranging from performance to software engineering to security. We have an initial uh, uh, attempt uh, for a solution, which is the unmask tool, which can non-invasively and reasonably efficiently extract a substantive class of application queries. There's still, of course, a long ways to go. But as I said uh, earlier, I'm more surprised by how far we've been able to come rather than how far we still have to go. And there are several challenging open problems to be solved. And there are more details on our website uh, here. So with that, uh, thank you for the patient listening. And if you had any questions, I'd be happy to uh, respond to them. Yeah. OK, let's give Dan a round of applause. Thanks. That was awesome. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of yeah. new things. <laughs> Very fascinating work. Thank you for sharing with us. Yeah, it's a simple problem to state, but it has not revealed challenges. There is, there is a lot of work in the security community around adversarial ML, which yes, resembles okay. this. They want to extract right. the model, model based right. on the inputs outputs exactly, as well. Exactly. That's like, especially insurance <laughs> models and so on. You want to get your competitor's model. Or the AI services so. that cloud computing vendors exactly. offer. They want right. to just reverse engineer and reverse get right. input outputs, just get the model from that. Right. Some accuracy, it turns out you can do it. <laughs> Has there been anything I was saying that what's the maximum complexity of the model that could be extracted? There is a lot of work, but I don't think it's definitive. The classes of functions they can handle are still very simple. Um, for linear oh. functions, you can make some, you can state some theorems from learning theory, but not so much. Here, it's very cool that you have individual components. Right. You know the logic of each component. And, right. and, right. So and, and since it SQL down, is a limited possible. language, you also have more constraints. It, it's not an arbitrary thing. Right? That I believe in the software system. engineering and software testing world, first testing is all the rage now, where they want to right. tweak the inputs and outputs and then try to figure out program behavior, figure out where it right. breaks. So like this started security. by Mark Miller at Wisconsin, the first papers on first testing. Is that right? In fact, it happened because there was a, uh, a thunderstorm and they, there was a he had, uh, he had uh, this uh, 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 dial up modem which was uh -huh. linking to the Wisconsin server and he lost that because the because the lightning strike the communication broke and then he said okay if this happens because of a random instance <laughs> let me try random instances on all the popular tools and he found that most of them failed and even four years after wow. doing that he found this still continue to fail on the same thing they're not fixed any of them so that was the origin of first testing was the Wisconsin thunderstorm That's which amazing. caused a communication glitch and killed his connection in it. So, yeah. it's fascinating. No? So here it's very cool that you've shown that even with just one row and with just, this you, know, really it, you don't need right. that much right. data. And most to of the things that we're looking at is we're looking at the cardinality, but if you start looking at the values also, which is what we're doing now, you can actually extract a lot more. So, mm -hmm. like cool. this is very clever. And there are connections, there are connections for logic. But yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, Bound with model theorems out there for different logic that's enough to find a model of a certain size and yeah. all the steps. 
expense to uh, satisfy really big commitments. So I, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure there is some deep connection here. Okay, let me stop the recording here.